terrible clock down here, which is going to start moving in a minute. Um, and it goes backwards, not forwards. Um, I don't know how you follow somebody who could speak uh, for 12 minutes without looking at her notes and be so moving and so warm in what she had to say. And neither do I know why anybody bothered to invite me to speak to an ethics conference. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> unless it was to watch uh, a real life human being crash and burn. Uh, it's like somebody tweeted uh, uh, after my column yesterday, I am the guy, after all, who supported the construction cartel. And um, uh, it reminded me a little bit of a game the Kennedy family rep are reputed to have played in Kennebunkport, or wherever they used to go on holiday, um, where you had to supply the answer and somebody had to supply the question. So Ted, uh, or Jack, was looking at his plate, looking at what he was eating, and he said, chicken teriyaki. And up popped Bobby's hand and he said, I know, it's the question was who was the only surviving Japanese kamikaze pilot in... <laughs> Good morning. Anyway, until I read that tweet, I really didn't have much idea what I was going to say uh, uh, this morning. Um, under pressure from the organizers these last few weeks, what is your speech going to be about? What is your speech going to be about? And I was trying to do a million other things. I kept on saying to my PA, Tell them it's about uncertainty, um, <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> so if, if I'm down on the program of speaking about uncertainty, I know absolutely nothing about the ethics of uncertainty. I just didn't know what I was going to talk about. Um, anyway, so following the tweet, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, and what it'll be is a brief but deeply flawed history of the end of the South African construction cartel and my part in its telling. Um, uh, it's a story of my own really poor execution uh, of something I thought I knew clearly and I thought I could see clearly. I was trying to tell what I thought was a complex story and everybody else was telling what they thought was a very simple case of good and evil. I got some things wrong, I got some things right, and if we apply Ludwig Wittgenstein's theory of certainty, yeah, which my PA drew to my attention, by the way, um, I know nothing. Um, what I know, I believe, I think he said, which kind of cancel each other out. Um, anyway, it's fine. The story of the construction cartel this year starts off in February. Someone in one of the Sunday papers has shown a dossier by whom we don't know, um, detailing in, in, in obviously credible detail um, uh, the story of years of collusion and malpractice, um, decades of uh, really awful behavior by the big construction companies. They've manipulated prices on some of the most iconic projects in our country, and including some of the 2010 stadia, including the one here in Cape Town. By any standards, it's a great story. Um, all goes quiet again until a few months later, and the Competition Commission announces that it has um, fined the big construction companies 1.4 billion rand for collusive practices um, and it lists the projects and who has to pay what fine and et etc. Et et and the media went mad. Here, finally, was business caught with its hand in the cookie jar. Um, uh, the capitalists, we now know for certain, are also corrupt and you could almost feel the relief. Business, business is widely despised in South Africa and, uh, uh, and, and it was pretty... That, that, attitude was really on show now. The firms themselves were quiet, uh, which is probably wise, but I read all this stuff with alarm because I could see real harm being done. Um, the only businesses in South Africa that could possibly compete with anything else big in the world are the construction companies. They could build anything anywhere, and they have. Clearly, some executives and managers in these companies had behaved appallingly over many years, and they were to blame. And I really hate them for doing that. And my great hope now is that they get identified and prosecuted, and if they have to go to jail, they can go to jail. They deserve it. I want to hear, though, I want to hear the trial. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to watch. I want to hear the, the cross-examination. All I had for two months was competition commission spin, um, uh, faithfully reproduced at me week after week. So I started writing against the tide a little bit. 
in my weekly column and in some editorials. It seemed obvious to me that without some form of collusion, there was no way that the stadiums for the 2012-2010 World Cup could have been completed on time. And I wrote that. I wasn't trying to absolve anybody. I was simply trying to explain how the construction companies work, why they cheat sometimes. Remember that when SA won the FIFA bid in 2004, the plan wasn't to build Greenpoint and it wasn't to build the, the FNB Stadium. It was, to it was to use Ellis Park and Newlands. Yeah. And it was only in 2006 when the local or the organizing committee decided to build two new stadiums that it then went out and it invited all of the big construction firms to a meeting so that they could talk about how we were going to do this extra work, meet this impossible deadline now that they had changed their minds about what to build, um, and, and how the work would be shared out. But sharing of information is the very essence of collusion. Why would the state be, which is what the LOC was, why would the state be inviting it? And I suspect it was doing so because it knew that it was in big deadline trouble. The only way to have avoided some sharing, which we'll, so shall we call it, would have been for the LOC to have spoken to all the firms separately and for them all to have tendered separately without knowing whether the others were tendering or for what for all the stadiums. But even if you were Murray and Roberts, even if you were as big as them, and doing that for four stadiums, and then by some stroke of rotten luck you won the stadiums, you'd still be building in Nelspruit today. Under the kind of competition demanded by the public and the competition commission, it would have, been, it would have had to be possible and even feasible for one tendering construction firm to win everything. But by the tw 2006, that was a simply a fantasy, whatever we might wish today. It wouldn't have been possible to do. The other thing that irritated me about was the assumption that the colluding firms had made huge profits as a result of the information sharing. The fact is, we still don't know how much money they made out of collusion. None, all that reporting you saw never told you how much money they made. We know, because we were always told, and every story that South Africa's big construction firms have been found guilty of collusion in billions of rands worth of contracts. But the billions of rands weren't what they got. That was the price of the contract. It's still impossible to know, and the only way we are going to know is when the trials come, if they come, and people are put on trial and they can tell us, their financial directors and their accountants can tell us how much money they really made. Not once also did any report consider that even with collusion in place, it was possible to lose money on a contract or to not get the contract at all. It's a fact that at Rustenburg, two companies did collude to get the contract and they both lost. And someone they'd forgotten to collude with won it. <laughs> you know, an awful truth about collusion is that while it's illegal, and rightly so, to conspire to defraud, it may, in fact, lower rather than raise prices, or at least slow the rate of the increase in construction costs. That's because people in construction don't collude because they're greedy. They collude because they're scared. They collude because of the, the penalty clauses at the, in contracts which say that if you're late, you pay. And it's very, very difficult to price every possibility into what you do. I've no doubt that as a result of of the fines against companies and the new concentration on them that construction prices over time, especially in the government's infrastructure program, will rise. The second last thing that bugged me was how um, uh, constru construction firms got nailed for the, for, the, uh, for the bad behavior of a few. And in fact, lots of people would have known about the corruption. Um, when, you, when, when an architect designs a building, he gives his design to a quantity surveyor who then puts a bill of quantities together, who then get passed on to the construction company. The bill of quantities says, well, how much cement do you need, and et cetera, et cetera, and the builder prices that. I know that because my dad was a builder, and I watched him sweat blood trying to get his prices right in a small town. And, and there is no way that the quantity surveyor doesn't know how much that building should cost. So when the price comes in and it's higher than he would have thought, 
and he doesn't tell his client because he doesn't work for the construction company. He works for the client. In the case of the stadium, the city of Cape Town. Why didn't he say something? What did he say to his client? That's a fair price? Well, that seems a bit high to me. We don't know. We'll find out at the trial. Then, you know, right in the middle of the row, something amazing happens. And I'm getting all sorts of stick, by the way, for saying this kind of thing. One of the saintly figures of the New South Africa stands up. His name is Ketso Gordon, who many of you will know, former DG of Transport to McMurray, city manager of Joburg, and now CEO of PPC, Big Cement Company. He says, now hang on, we need an we need a infrastructure codessa. Um, and what he means is that the big builders, the cement makers, rebar industry, should get together and talk about how to make the infrastructure program work. Otherwise, he says, we're headed for failure. In other words, they need to collude. But crucially, this time, the government has to be at the table. It's the client, and therefore, it will be all right to collude. It's interesting how, despite the uproar caused by the, com the com Competition Commission's findings, that when the dust begins to settle, what the firms have been doing all along is now forms the basis of a way forward, a reasonable-looking solution. It's not, it's not collusion. It's officially sanctioned collusion. I don't remember much comment when Roger Jardine who resigned in disgust at the industry as CEO of Avenge, made an impassioned speech at Wits in September, calling for a new ethic and a new morality in construction. He, too, was acutely aware that the reputational damage done to the industry in the wake of the competition um, uh, findings was severe, and his remedy was very familiar. A public space, he says, must be carved out for authentic engagements between the government and the private sector without unfair advantage being derived by one party. Authentic engagements, that wouldn't involve information sharing, would it? Of course it would. There's just no other way to get the job done except by and keeping pricing, pricing under control. Just that, according to these guys, if the government becomes a partner in crime, then everything's all right. I'm not sorry I try to stand up for the construction industry. It's very important to South Africa, and I do it again. The individuals aren't my concern. As Max Price said earlier on today, quoting Abe Lincoln, Nothing is wholly evil nor wholly good. That works for me. Life is complex, not simple. Thank you.